Hello and welcome to another episode of Iron Science Teacher. My name is Julie Yu. I'm a senior scientist here at the Exploratorium, and I'm the director of the Teacher Institute, which is a program where we work with middle and high school science teachers. Um, Iron Science Teacher is a show that we do. It's based on a cult Japanese cooking show where the chefs had to create a meal out of a secret ingredient. In Iron Science Teacher, we have wonderful teachers who are participating in our programs use a secret ingredient that I will admit is secret to you, but not to them. They will take that ingredient and transform it into a wonderful demonstration or lesson about a scientific concept. We usually use very simple ingredients for our secret ingredient, and this year we're actually inspired by a special exhibition we have here at the Exploratorium. So this summer, we have an exhibition of Teo Janssen's strand beasts. These are amazing creatures that Teo builds, and they normally live on the beaches of Holland. And this year, we're very fortunate to have a bunch of strand beasts here at the Exploratorium on Pier 15, just outside the central gallery, or just outside the webcast studio where we're, where we're webcasting this show, um, are a bunch of indoor strand beasts that used to be on the beaches of Holland. All of the secret ingredients in this year's Iron Science Teachers have been inspired by things that Teo uses to make his strand beasts. Um, so are you guys ready to meet today's contestants? Yeah. Great. Once again, these teachers are four of the best teachers on the planet. They decided to spend a chunk of their summer here at the Exploratorium working with us to do better science teaching in their classrooms. So please welcome our first contestant. She's taking the High School Summer Institute, Nilly Bexbaum. <laughs> Nilly, can you tell folks where and what you teach? I teach chemistry at Kip King Collegiate Charter School in San Lorenzo. Wonderful, welcome Nilly. Awesome, next up we have taking the Middle School Institute. Please welcome Denise Dowsett. Yeah. Nilly, come back. Denise, can you tell folks where and what you teach? I am at Hillview Middle School in Menlo Park, and I am teaching physical science. Wonderful. Welcome, Denise. Yeah. Hang out, hang out, come back. You can hang out here. Um, third up, we have taking our high school institute. Please welcome Jason Belville. I'm just going to over here. Jason, can you tell folks where and what you teach? I teach uh, earth science, biology, chemistry, and physics at Upper Lake High School. All of that. Please welcome Jason. All right, and last but not least, we have another participant in our Middle School Summer Institute. Please welcome Eric Sarb. <laughs> Eric, can you tell folks where and what you teach? I teach seventh grade math and science at Gateway Middle School. Awesome, welcome Eric. So these are our four contestants today. Um, the next ingredient we have to reveal is the secret ingredient, and that is hiding on this table. So contestants, can you please gather around? for the big reveal. Once we reveal the ingredient, the contestants are gonna have five minutes to prepare their demonstration, and then they will one by one come and give their demonstration to you, the audience. Um, so again, the ingredients of summer have been part of strand beasts. The first week, we had compressed air, which is the energy that strand beasts use to move. The second week, we had PVC, which are the bones and the muscles of strand beasts. And this week, we have the major internal organ of a strand beast. The secret ingredient today, you guys ready? Is plastic bottles. <laughs> plastic bottles, plastic bottles. Um, oh, you guys ready? Get set. Go, grab your materials and start building your demo. Um, plastic bottles are what Teo calls the wind stomachs of the strand beast. So if you take a look at the beast, they all have lines of plastic bottles so that they can pull in air and compress them and the strand beast can move even when um, it's not windy. It's pretty amazing. So contestants have now grabbed some materials and they're gonna work to build their demo. What could it be? Right now, we're at the end. We're taking a look at Nilly Buxbaum, who's grabbing some gravel. Uh, and she's taking some gravel and measuring it out. And she also has a 
picture of a dark looking liquid there. Um, Nilly's a big fan of outdoor activities. She likes to go hiking and running and biking. And um, if it's raining outside, she goes indoors and watches Downton Abbey. So she trains her body and her mind. And we'll see if all of that training um, is going to give her a, a boost up here today in Iron Science Teacher. Uh, next up, we're taking a look at Eric Sarp, who is very carefully measuring something. Looks like a small cork. Um, he grabbed one of the two liter soda bottles, which are very similar to the bottles that are in Strand Beast. And yeah, he's checking it out, testing it to see. Um, Maybe he's going to sing a tune or see how tightly it goes. Eric um, is a break dancer. I don't know if you can tell by looking at him. He's one of the tallest break dancers you'll see. He actually <laughs> runs a uh, break dance club at a school. There you go. Yeah. Is today Eric's lucky break? Can he dance his way to the top? We will see. All right, next up, we're going to take a look at Jason Belleville, who is pulling off some duct tape, a very important ingredient for every teacher and homeowner and anyone who makes anything. Oh, yeah. um, and er, let's see, Jason has, it looks like he stuffed a balloon in his bottle. What could he possibly be doing that? Um, he's taping, let's see, a little purple balloon. All right. There's a little hole in the bottom, he says. So he's building something with a balloon and a hole. There it is. Um, our teachers go all around the world to learn about science and work about science. And Eric told me that he once spent two weeks um, chasing scorpions in the Mojave Desert for research, which is pretty fantastic. So we'll see if he feels the, you know, the sweet uh, feeling of victory or the sting of defeat today, an iron science teacher. Um, last up, we're taking a look at Denise Dowsett, who's poured some powder into a funnel, um, and that's falling into a plastic bottle. Has some liquid at the bottom. Um, she's mixing it up. Yeah, it looks like a kind of purplish, yellowish, bluish liquid. We'll see what she's making with that. Um, Denise also has traveled around the world quite a bit, and she's told me she has, she's had a bunch of encounters with animals. She's gone diving with sharks, and one time she was in Africa, she said she was trapped in her tent surrounded by baboons. Um, yeah, we'll see if that experience gave her the strength and fortitude, because now she's surrounded by the primates that are iron science teacher. <laughs> uh, maybe she'll, yeah, she'll <laughs> bust her way to the top. She got out of that situation, so it's great. All right, contestants, we're going to give you one last minute. We're about to play the music here, so make sure all of the things are working. You know what you want to say. Get your best pedagogy ready, because we are about to uh, count down the last 30 seconds of preparation. Now that you've prepared their lesson, so all of the contestants have prepared their lesson that they're about to show you. And now it's time for you guys to prepare because you have a job too. Your job at the end of Iron, Scientist, or Iron Science Teacher is to vote for your favorite presentation. And you're going to show that by the strength of your applause. Can you guys do that job? Yeah. Feel up to it? Fantastic. So I'm going to ask you to pay attention because at the end, you're going to have to cheer for who you think should be Iron Science Teacher. First up, we want to welcome, she's taking uh, the High School Institute. Please welcome Nilly Buxbaum. So I didn't really get the memo that this was Iron Science Teacher. Someone told me that this was Fear Factor Science Teacher. Um, and I'm up, always up for a challenge, so I decided to do it anyway. And I believe today's challenge was to drink this really disgusting, green, dirty water. So I'm going to show you how dirty this water is. 
that's really dirty. And there's something floating in there. And in fact, to make it even more disgusting, I'm going to add just a little bit more dirt just to prove that I'm really the fear factor science teacher. <laughs> Luckily, I also happen to know some survival skills. So if any of you are ever stuck on a deserted island and you have to drink some questionable water, all you will need to collect are a few simple items so that you can filter it out and drink it safely. The first item you will need is a two liter bottle that has washed up onto the shore. <laughs> the next item you will need is some sand. There should be lots of sand on a deserted island, so that should be really easy. The third item you will need is some gravel. That probably shouldn't be too hard either to find on a deserted island. And the last thing you're going to need is some activated carbon. <laughs> that might be a little more difficult to find, but it's not that hard to make it. So they take some like charcoal, like carbon, and they heat it to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> and then that purifies it and creates these little pores that actually can pick up chemicals, smells, color that may have been making your water impure. And once you've collected all your items and put them in layers to make your filter, you're ready to go. So all you got to do is take your contaminated water, really gross, dirty water, and pour it through your filter. And then you got to wait. Does that water look pretty clean? Yeah, it looks, looks much cleaner. Who's thirsty? <laughs> So I'm just going to wait for this water to drip out, and just as a final hurrah, and because after all this talking I'm getting thirsty myself, I'm going to drink my really disgusting, dirty, fear factor water, and I'm going to win this challenge. <laughs> So here we go. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Delicious. That's fantastic. Let's hear from Billy Buxbaum, who's willing to drink purified water that she purified herself with the help of a plastic bottle. That looked disgusting, but it won some bubbles from the crowd. Um, all right, next up, please welcome a participant from our middle school institute, Denise Dowsett. Okay. So I'm going to start with a little story. Very recently, my son came down in the morning. We get up pretty early. And he walks into the kitchen and he sees all these plastic bottles, soda bottles, lined up. And he has a huge sigh and this huge smile on his face. He goes, Mom, I am so glad you decided to become a science teacher. I'm pretty new to it, so he's, kids have watched me transition mid-career to teaching. So I, you know, cockles in my heart are starting to warm up. I'm thinking he's going to say something very validating about all the stuff he's learning about how the world works, or how I'm more patient, a better listener. And he says, Mom, you never used to buy soda. And now I come down to breakfast, and I got root beer and Coke. So. Good news, you can do a lot with a plastic bottle. So, today we're going to use plastic bottles to think about density and polarity. Okay? So, let's just start by reviewing a couple of concepts. Just going to use this ball. 
I can't collapse it entirely. But what is density, right? Does everybody remember what mass is? It's a measure of how much stuff, physical stuff there is, right? What's that stuff? Atoms and molecules, okay? And we have a pretty good idea what volume is. It's the amount of space you can stuff stuff into, right? Okay. So density has to do with how much stuff, measured in mass, you can get into a certain amount of space. So can you imagine if you had like a Nerf ball, right? There's a certain amount of stuff in here. And you could squish it, squish it, squish it, squish it till it's really small. With maybe subtraction of some air molecules, you still have pretty much the same amount of stuff, but in a smaller amount of space, okay? So that's kind of what density is about, right? Okay, so it turns out, you guys know about lava lamps, right? Can you picture that? Okay. So traditional lava lamp, very good. Traditional lava lamp uses differences in density to entertain us, get us in the mood. Okay. So, um, and an additional lava lamp, heat's used, right? So what happens when you heat certain things? Do they expand or contract? Depending on the material, right? Different rates, so that's what traditional lava lamps depend on. So we're gonna do something a little bit different. So let's see how observant you guys are. I think all of you are familiar with uh, salad dressing, right? Okay. Does anybody remember what happens when you mix oil and water? It separates. Anybody remember what's on top, though? Where does the water go? Where does the oil go? What do you think? Very good. Okay, so we're going to use the same. So what do we end up with? Let's try this. Ooh, gotta get us in the mood. All right. All right, bear with me. Gotta do this. Okay. Okay. Good. Send the mood. Okay. Okay. I know you need a little velvet or felt or something. All right. All right. Okay. going on? I'm going to answer that question. That was rhetorical. All right, so we got density. What's at the bottom down here? What do you think? Water or oil? Water. And it so happens that food coloring dissolves, mixes really well with water. So this is where polarity comes in. Have you ever thought about why they separate, right? You have to keep shaking your salad dressing and you got to mix it in really fast or gravy that you make. You notice how the fat always seems to go to the top, you gotta pour it off, right? Okay, what's going on? Well, it so happens that water molecules have what's called polarity. They have slight charge differences from one side of the molecule to the other. So if you make a V, sorry, I got a Band-Aid on one finger, use the other one, right? Two hydrogens, one oxygen. Little bit negative down at the bottom of the V, a little bit positive 
over the hydrogen. So water molecules kind of like to stick together. And they orient themselves so you've got your slightly positive side closer to your negative side. And they like to kind of group together. So when they kind of group together, they push stuff that doesn't fit away. So I could shake this up, and if you waited, they'd separate back out. Okay? But what's happening with the bubbles when I put the Alka-Seltzer in? So what happens Alka-Seltzer reacts with water to create carbon dioxide, a gas. As that gas, which is less dense, rises, it tends to carry some of that colored stuff with it up to the top. Hits the top, the gas pops and escapes out, and it falls back down. So instead of heat, we're using that, Alka-Seltzer method. So I thought we'd try something a little different now. I'm going to put the caps back on just because I'm a klutz. And I don't want you guys to get covered with the oil. So let's try this with Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to use setting the mood again. I'm going to use something else. So I want you guys to get your groove on. We're going to get groovy. All right. get dark enough. Okay, so we're taking a look inside the box now. some powder in here. And we're backlighting it with some UV. And let's see. Imagine darker room. There we go. The Austin Powers Amazing. Lava Lamp. Glowing lava lamp. Let's hear it for Denise Dowsett, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for grooving out to a homemade lava lamp. Um, it's really fascinating when you look inside. It really is glowing. Um, thank you, Denise. I'm going to help you uh, kind of get out of the way. We want to make sure we have enough room for our next contestant. Uh, I'm not going to cover these all the way because they're going to explode. All right, I think we are ready for our third contestant. Please welcome a participant from our high school institute, Jason Belville. <laughs> All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I want to start out with the fact really that I have mixed yeah, emotions about water, about plastic bottles. From an environmental standpoint, plastic bottles are not very good for us. They're, um, they could release toxins for us and future generations, and they don't biodegrade very well. But if you're looking at a, um, uh, looking at it from a chemistry or an engineering standpoint, plastic bottles are pretty amazing. We can the chemistry process that we use to make them is amazing to start with, but then we end up with this object that's very light. It's actually very strong, but it's also flexible at the same time, and it can seal, which is pretty amazing. <clears throat> so I'm going to use uh, plastic bottles to uh, show you a couple of things. Uh, as a science teacher, plastic bottles are great because they're very versatile. Um, I want to talk about air today. Um, we all know that air is around us all the time. If you guys ever have any doubts of whether there is air around you, all you have to do is this. If you do that, you will see that you are pushing something and it is pushing against your face. There is, in fact, air all around us. But we have a tendency to think of air as soft or weak, but it's not. Air is only kind of soft or weak only if it can escape. So like I squeeze this plastic bottle and that air just moves right out of there. It seems kind of soft. But then if I put the cap on to where it doesn't let the air escape, 
All of a sudden, it seems very strong. And I know what you're thinking. Well, you don't look very strong, so maybe it's not, you're, you just don't have the strength to do it. But what I may, I may not have strength, but what I do have is mass. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys right now that the air that's contained in these bottles is, in fact, strong. And I will do this. I will take our duct tape, which is pretty amazing stuff to start with, and tape these bottles to my shoes. <laughs> this is not only good science, it's really fun. <laughs> All right, so there's one. Where's my other bottle? You guys think it's going to hold me up? Come on, Denise bought the groove, but uh, Jason brought the soul. <laughs> oh, man. Nothing better than a good pun. All right, maybe I can get you guys to move to the side a little bit so I can walk over there. Look at that. That air that we think of as soft or weak is actually holding me up. And take my word, I'm pretty massive. Watch. I'm going to take the caps off and you guys see what's going to happen. Oh. And my weight just crushes the bottle right down. So it was, in fact, the air holding me up. So air is, in fact, stronger than we think it is. But even after this demonstration, air is actually stronger than we even think. And my next gen uh, demonstration, using a plastic bottle, will show that also. So I have, here I have a plastic bottle. I've inverted a balloon in the top of it. And I have drilled a hole in the side of it. As long as I leave this hole unplugged and allow the air to escape, I can blow this balloon up. And then I plug the hole, and it, uh, <clears throat> it will suck right back. Ooh. So anyways, the, the air pushes it right back. I was hoping that I could get a seal on this and make it where it doesn't go back. Let's see if I can uh, adjust it a little bit and make that work. This never happens to me in class. <laughs> Always works. So anyways, it's like I can blow this up and immediately the air just pushes it right back. So air is actually stronger than we think. Not only does it have strength to resist a, a movement when it escapes, it actually pushes right back. It's always pushing down on us where it's always compressed air that we live in, basically. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's hear it for Jason. Showed us the power of air. Air is there and air has strength. Okay, we're ready for our last contestant. Um, he's working on growing out his beard. <laughs> Please welcome Eric Sarb. Check, check. It's actually the longest it's ever been right now. And right now and right now. <laughs> oh. All right. Okay, so behold the plastic bottle. This simple container has many great functions. The first of which is delivering awesome soft drinks like Fanta and Sunkist to our convenience stores for us to enjoy. Um, but you can also have other types of fun with this, not just Fanta. Um, you can play the half-filled water bottle toss game. And I, I could play this for hours. I actually have. Um, it's pretty mindless when you need a break. Um, but my favorite, 
um, I discovered when I was in middle school. I'm parched up here. Uh, and uh, you have to have a completely empty bottle to do this. And this is completely empty, right, you guys? Right. No, you guys didn't pay attention to Jason's lesson at all. <laughs> what is inside of this? Air, that's right. Um, and so you have to twist this. And when you twist this, it's, it's increasing what inside of it? See if you paid attention a little bit more. I'm, I'm under a lot of pressure right now. It's Eric Muller. Um, it increases the pressure, right? There's less space for all these molecules to be in, and so they're pushing on each other more and more, and it's in fact also pushing on this, which can be kind of fun, but don't try this at home. Um, let's see if this first one works. Whoa. Whoa. And you guys can see a little cloud that came out of there, because when uh, these molecules condense, they get closer, right, and they can become a liquid, and that's how clouds form. Um, and so I've really enjoyed doing this, but I wanted to work on my skills. And so I went to the store and I bought a plastic pop bottle pop gun target so that I could practice my accuracy on these. And as you can tell, when you uh, use that, that water bottle like that, it, it goes off in some kind of crazy direction. Um, so I want to use one that I can keep a little bit more straight and I'm going to need another projectile that uh, is going to be able to hit this target. And so Kids up front, I'm just going to let you guys know, watch out. We might have some ricocheted, uh, ricocheted corks coming at you. That's right. This inching backwards that's happening, that's oh, yeah. <laughs> Just like keep inching. Just, yeah, just be quick with your hands if it happens. And so I'm going to line this up here, make sure that uh, I'm on the target. And then I'm going to give it a lot of pressure at once because that wasn't enough. So I'm going to have to use all of my body weight as well. Oh, man. I don't know. Do we have a direct hit there? I can tell. Was it a miss? I'll have to put it closer next time. And also, um, I don't know if that cork's going to be strong enough to make it through this target. It's actually three poster papers thick right there. And so I need a more massive projectile. If you listen to Denise, as you know, that, that means there's more stuff inside of this. It actually weighs more. And if we accelerate that, I mean, put the same amount of pressure on it, um, and it has more mass, it's actually going to have more force, and more energy to do work like the Strand Beasts do with Theo Janssen. And uh, we'll see if this can make it through. <sighs> All right, you guys give me a countdown. Three, two, two one. one. Oh, no. Did, did I have a direct hit? It went over? This, that's exactly what I meant it to do. Because I, I actually, I won't, I won't lie, I practiced this a little bit before, and there's not enough pressure inside of this, so we're going to have to have a lot more air molecules to press on it. And so I'm going to grab my rogue projectiles over here. And let's try. I actually haven't tried to get through three poster papers, so we'll see if this is going to be enough. All right, one more time. Three, two, two one. one. Oh. Hey. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to be in front of it when I use this projectile. Thank you very much. Good move. Right on target. Let's hear it for Eric Sarb. That's great. All right, folks, now the power turns to you. You're going to vote for who you think did the best science demonstration. We're going to call out the contestants, and I'll, then I'll remind you what they did. And then by the strength of your applause, we're going to crown today's iron science teacher. Sound good? You guys ready? You have, you have an idea in mind who your favorite was? OK, fantastic. Come on out, contestants. Let's welcome back Nilly, Denise, Jason, and Eric. All right, remember Nilly uh, braved drinking really dirty, gross water because she created a, a water purifier uh, to make a delicious, refreshing beverage. Denise showed you how to make a homemade lava lamp. No heat, no light, and she grooved out while we saw uh, the impact of density inside a soda bottle. Jason showed us the power of air and actually how much pressure um, air can have as long as it's contained. And then Eric, uh, built on several lessons before and made a projectile launcher, a pop gun, out of a uh, plastic bottle. You guys know your favorite? 
All right, I have my trusty sound level meter here, and I'm gonna measure your, the strength of your applause, so please applaud um, for your favorite iron science teacher. So let's hear it for Nilly. <laughs> Let's see what you thought of Denise. Yeah. All right, let's hear it for Jason. And let's see if you thought Eric was the best. This was incredibly close today, but the meter does not lie. The winner of Iron Science to Teacher today is Eric Sarb. All right, thank you so much, contestants. Thank you, audience, for coming. You've participated in the all too rare chance to applaud teachers for great teaching. Um, this is the last episode of the season of Iron Science Teacher. Thank you to the webcast team. Um, enjoy your day at the Exploratorium. Take care, folks.